Hello, my name is Tarek Abdelatif. I'm a music and adventure photographer based out of Portland, Oregon. In this video, I'm going to be talking about five different tips that I wish I knew when I was first getting into photography. So with the hook out of the way, let's get this video started. The first tip that I'd like to discuss is something that I wish I was doing at least two to three years before I actually even started doing it, and it's shooting in RAW versus JPEG. These are usually the two main formats available when using a DSLR, like the one that I'm using to record this video. Basically what this means is that a RAW photo that you capture from your camera is going to be completely unprocessed and uncompressed. This does take up a lot more space than your regular JPEG image, but you have way more freedom in post-production when you're editing. I shoot with a Sony camera, which means that my RAW file format is going to be .ARW. If you're going to be shooting with Nikon, it's going to be .NEF. And with Canon, it's going to be either .CR2 or .CR3. You get the idea. The major advantage of shooting RAW is that you don't lose any valuable image data. If you're shooting a low light concert or a landscape with the sky that's overexposed and both are in JPEG, there's really not much that you can do since the image is technically in its final state. With raw images, you can really bring the photo to life by making the colors pop, like in this first example, or by manipulating the shadows if the original photo was too dark in some areas. For this next one, I wanna share a quick personal story. When I was first practicing using my DSLR, I went to visit Multnomah Falls here in Oregon, and a lot of the photos I was taking were too bright or too dark, and I admittedly had no idea how to correct the lighting or use the settings. If you haven't guessed it by now, the second tip is understanding your camera settings, more specifically your aperture, your shutter speed, and your ISO. Let's talk about them. Simply stated, the aperture is the hole in the lens that lets light pass through to enter the camera. On top of being able to manipulate the exposure of your images by making them brighter or darker, you can also manipulate the depth of field of your images. At one extreme, the aperture gives you a blurred effect while hyper-focusing on a subject like this first example. On the other extreme, it will give you a sharp photo from the nearby foreground to the farthest point in your shot. And the last thing that I want to discuss about aperture is your f-stop or your f-number, which you may see on some of your lenses. f1.8, for example, is going to be a lot larger than f16. You're going to hate me for saying this, but an easy way to remember this is with fractions. f2 is one half, and f16 is one sixteenth. One half is obviously bigger than one sixteenth, and by that same logic, an aperture at f2 is much larger than an aperture at f16. Again, simply stated, the ISO is another setting that's going to brighten or darken your photo. The higher the ISO number is, the brighter the photo will be. As easy as this sounds, if your ISO is too high, there can be consequences. Look at this example I took when I was first getting started that has a high ISO. There's a lot of noise and grain. Not much I can really do in post-production to correct this either. Low light concerts and astrophotography are really good examples of when ISO will be really important. But if you're shooting during the day, an ISO of 100 will be perfectly fine. The last of the camera settings that I want to touch up on for tip number two is shutter speed. Look at this photo of Alice in Wonderland in 2019. See your hand? That's because my shutter speed wasn't fast enough and I'm still not over it. Shutter speed is responsible for two things. Changing the brightness, of course, just like the other two camera settings, and creating these dynamic effects like blurring motion or freezing action. I want to talk about both of them. Fast shutter speeds, like 1 800th of a second, for example, are more frequently used to freeze motion and action. A rowdy concert, a bird flying, you name it. You're essentially freezing time and can sometimes capture things that might not even be visible to our own eyes. On the other end, a slow shutter speed, like having the shutter open for a whole five seconds, is used for long exposure shots, like creating a sense of motion on rivers or waterfalls, while keeping everything else completely sharp. For tip number three, we're going to be talking about the composition of a photo. I don't know if this is a hot take or not, but in my personal opinion, composition is just as important as post-production, and I wish I was paying more attention to it when I was first getting started with photography. Basically, it's how the elements of a photo are placed or arranged. It's how photographers like us frame things to help the photograph become more interesting to the viewer. An easy example of this is a regular photo of a waterfall. Sure, it's a cool photo, but most, including myself, might feel like it lacks something. Now look what just changing the angle of the photo can do. It's so much more dynamic now. The blurry foreground alone gives the photo depth. All around a better photo, in my opinion. If you miss your mark on composition when you're out shooting, you can still fix this in post-production, which is a perfect segue for tip number four, understanding your editing software. For this part of the video, I'll be using Lightroom as my example. 
Here's a recent photo I just recently edited and posted on Instagram. It follows a rule of thirds with Mount Hood on the left. The rule of thirds is a composition guideline where instead of the main subject of the photo being front and centered, the subject is instead placed where the lines would meet if they were cut into nine even sections, which in some cases is more pleasing to the human eye. I use the crop lock tool in Lightroom to accomplish this, and I always make sure I have the aspect ratio crop lock enabled so that my photo will fit perfectly on my website amongst other photos that are in the same orientation. While we're in Lightroom, I also wanted to show you two more little tweaks that I wish I started using when I first got started. They have since been integrated in my style of editing and they are the tone curve and the split toning sliders. The first thing I like to do with the tone curve is lifting the line in the bottom left ever so slightly to give the image a nice fade. With my concert photos, I like to do the same, but by lifting the red shadows instead, since there's way less rules with concert images. You can do the same thing under where it says shadows too, in the split toning panel. Make sure the hue is dragged all the way to either side of the slider and move the saturation up ever so slightly to give it a similar, if not same effect. I do this with most of my concert photos where blue is the most prominent color. In the highlight section, I will usually manipulate the blues, reds, and yellow oranges to mess with the sky's highlights. This is what gives the sunset or sunrise that extra pop of cotton candy coloring. Once I learned about this, I never stopped using it. I know I'm only talking about Lightroom, but some version of the tools I've described is probably available in the editing software or the apps that you use to edit your photos. My advice is just to practice every single day and that knowledge will compound and using these robust softwares will eventually become like second nature. The last tip I wanna talk about, and it is so important and has saved me from so many messes, is to always overshoot. I'm not talking about like holding down the shutter and letting it continuously shoot whatever the subject is. I'm talking about taking the same photo more than once. In case the photo is blurry or there's something wrong with the image, you're basically ensuring that you have these backups by taking those extra seconds to capture the same image. I find that this works best when the subject in the photo is blinking and you didn't catch it the first time. It's something that happened to me so many times in the past and I wish I took the time to take those second and third shots. And if you're delivering photos to a client, you can always delete the test shots, the duplicate shots, the misfocused shots, whatever's gonna dilute the final batch of images. If you didn't take that second shot, those would have been all you had to work with. If you've watched this far, I really hope you found value or learned something new from the five tips that I've mentioned. Like I said, these are things that I wish I knew when I was first getting started with photography. That said, if you did find value in this video, I would appreciate more than anything if you hit the like button or the subscribe button leave a comment on what you want to see next. All of this will help me and the channel out a lot, and I really thank you for the support. Thank you again, and I'll see you in the next video. Simply stated, the aperture is the hole in the lens that lets light pass through to enter the camera. That is, I should not have. <laughs> Still with me? Okay, good. For tip number th three, uh, we're getting, ah, God, that would've been good.